So the um, underlying question is whether there's an inexorable trade-off between economic uh, well-being, in particular the economic well-being of the poorest people in the world, and the protection of the environment, or whether these things can be complementary goals. The usual story, the story that is told by eco many economists and is sort of embedded in the minds of many people, is that there's some sort of trade-off between the two. You can have more environmental protection and less economic well-being, or you can have more economic well-being and less environmental protection. But you can't have them both. You can't make both grow. You've got some sort of what economists like to call a frontier between the two, and you can just pick you know, what's, the, what's the point along that frontier that you, uh, that you like the best. And this kind of trade-off comes up a lot. I mean, to give you an example, in current political discourse in the United States, whenever the EPA uh, tries to introduce any new regulations, as they've just done for uh, the emissions of um, hazardous air pollutants from power plants, we hear from uh, certain sides of the political spectrum and from certain business interests the idea that these are job-killing regulations, that clean air is somehow going to be inimical to uh, economic well-being of working people in the United States. And what I want to do tonight is, is basically challenge that assumption that there's always a trade-off. I don't want to say that there's never a trade-off. I just want to say that that's not the whole story. Um, so here's, uh, oh, let me just go back to this. And as I said, not only economic well-being is of interest to me, but also particularly the well-being of the poorest uh, people in the world for whom uh, economic well-being is, is, of course, the uh, preeminent issue. So uh, the way that I want, I'd like you to start thinking about this a little bit is to think that although we might have a trade-off like that, holding everything else constant, everything over history, over time, is not constant. And indeed, a lot of development is precisely about turning constants into variables. And so we can think about ways in which we might be able to move that frontier out and over time, thereby advance both goals at once. We might be able to ease that trade-off. We might be able to wind up at stages where we have less poverty and better environmental quality, better economic well-being and a healthier and safer environment for us all to live in. And the lens through which I want to think about that is a lens that has to do with thinking of the environment, thinking about nature as an asset, as a source of wealth, both as a source of natural resources for the production of goods and services and as the sink for the disposal of the wastes from our production and consumption. Economists, when they think about assets, usually have a somewhat narrower view of what assets are. They think about what sometimes is called net worth, real estate and liquid assets, financial holdings, etc. And those are important sorts of assets, but I want to suggest that natural assets, the assets that are given to us by nature, are also uh, terribly important. And that uh, thinking about assets partly comes from uh, studies that were done back in the 1990s that began to shift the attention of economists away from income, which was the you know, predominant focus of much research on uh, economic well-being and poverty, towards uh, assets. And initially, it was that economist definition of assets, net worth. And Melvin Oliver and Thomas Shapiro, two <coughs> sociologists, wrote this book, <coughs> Black Wealth, White Wealth, that looked in particular at the difference between uh, income and assets of a uh, median, that is to say the middle uh, percentile, half are richer, half are poor, white households and black households in the United States. And they found that in the case of income, the black-white ratio of median income was about 60%. So, uh, you know, the, the median black household had about 60% of the income level of the median white household in this country. These are data from the early 1990s probably hasn't changed a great deal uh, since that time. When they then looked at net worth, which economists and sociologists hadn't really done much of before that, they found that the ratio looked like this, that the ratio was 8% uh, as opposed to 60%. That in terms of net worth, uh, African Americans in the United States are far, far poorer than uh, white households, and poorer than you would guess by looking at income. And Oliver and Shapiro argued that this is a really important dimension of inequality, a really important dimension of poverty, because assets don't only generate flows of income. Assets, of course, are a stock. They persist through time. Income is a flow. But also, assets generate status, provide collateral for accessing credit markets. 
bring in a host of other benefits on top of the income benefit. So this helped to sort of get economists, including myself, thinking about assets and ultimately about natural assets as well. So assets generate income flows, assets provide collateral, assets provide social status. And the various kinds of assets that we can think about include not only net worth, the conventional economist notion, financial assets and real estate, but also what sometimes is called human capital. Economists have a way of coming up with these awkward expressions, but basically means <laughs> investment and education and health. Social capital, bonding capital that helps to bind communities of people together, bridging capital that allows them to reach out and develop networks with other communities. And finally, natural capital, which is what I'm going to be focusing in on today, both nature as a source of raw materials and as a sink for the disposal of waste.